we must take a very serious look at the one very important part of our life and that is the drinking water. How this drinking water is getting contaminate, contaminated and the analysis and removal of the emerging contaminants in waste water and drinking water has become of prime importance in today's world. Because we have found all over the globe that people are disposing waste water without treatment or sometimes with ineffective treatment. Now, as a result, the not only the waste water, but the waste water when it leaches down to the ground water, even uh, contaminates, contaminates the ground water. And most of the time, the ground water which is used for drinking purpose also gets contaminated. So, what are the contaminants in water? The occurrence of trace organic contaminants in waste water, their behavior during waste water treatment and production of drinking water are key issues in the reuse of water resources. When we try to look at water resources, we have to recycle and in process of recycling, we see that the waste water needs an elaborate treatment and if the elaborate treatment is not given to the waste water, it cannot be used as uh, or it is it has no reusability as drinking water. Elimination of different classes of emerging contaminants such as surfactants, degrades, pharmaceuticals and polar pesticides in waste water treatment plants was found to be rather low. So, sewage effluent are one of the main sources of these compounds and their treatment resistant metabolites. Analysis of several groups of emerging contaminants, acidic pharmaceuticals, antibacterial agents, acidic pesticides and surfactant metabolites in wastewater apply, applying conventional activated sludge treatment that is the AST and advanced treatment processes such as membrane bioreactors MBRs and advanced oxidation processes the AOPs as well as during production of the drinking water. So, all these have been applied the methods such as membrane bioreactors and the advanced oxidation processes the have been applied to make the waste water suitable for drinking purpose. But the contaminants are of huge variety and of are of different chemical classes. They could be from pharmaceuticals, from surfactant factories, from various other pesticide uh, industry and therefore, to be able to treat all of them effectively is a big challenge. Now, if we try to look at this particular um, slide, we will see that how the household water through the sewer goes to the waste water treatment plant and then it is then run into the rivers. The water works are supposed to be purifying the and uh, supplying the drinking water. So, that is what the water cycle looks like. Then there are industries which make direct discharge, untreated discharge in the rivers and we have seen this example in river Ganga. I will give you a small example. A friend of mine went to Haridwar for a holy dip in Ganga and when she took the holy dip in the evening, the water was fairly okay, but she still felt that there was some smell in the water. However, she just collected that water and brought it to her room. Next morning, they wanted to have an early morning water bath, water uh, dip in the Ganges and they went back again and this time they found that the Ganges was absolutely having a very fouling smell. Now, they still collected the water, they took the dip and they came back and had a bath even in, in their room, but 
to tell you this story, I just wanted to highlight the fact that all the industries in and around Haridwar were actually discharging their effluent directly just the way the graph uh, shows that industries they directly discharge their effluent or waste water into the rivers without even sometimes giving them even the elementary kind of treatment. And that is how you know um, these uh, uh, river bodies they get contaminated. And then of course, there are uh, animal farmings and effluents from their agricultural runoff that is also adding on to the pollutants in the rivers. And they, uh, it is then going to the ground water which uh, and the landfills are also causing leaching into the ground water. So, you see the whole you know situation is very grim from every source there is contamination from the household contamination is coming from the industry the contamination is coming from the animal farming uh, uh, the contamination is coming from agricultural runoff the contamination is coming it is all going into the river or going into the ground water and therefore the ground water that is supplied uh, for drinking is also needs very serious kind of treatment before it can be actually supplied for drinking purpose. Analysis of in a, uh, emerging contaminants in wastewater. One of the major limitations in the analysis of emerging con contaminants remains the lack of method for quantification of low concentration. Now, some of these contaminants are in trace quantity or micro quantity and therefore, it becomes a big challenge to analyze them. The prerequisite for proper risk assessment and monitoring of the quality of waste, surface and drinking waters is the availability of multi residue methods that permit measurements at the low nanogram per liter level or even below that. So, it is possible to analyze these emerging contaminants in waste water, surface water and drinking water only because there is a very good method called multi residue method which permits the measurements even at uh, nanogram per liter level or below that. However, these compounds have received little attention because they are not as regulatory list as environmental pollutants. However, today analytical methodology for methodology for different groups of emerging contaminant is being developed and an increasing number of method is reported in the literature. Still analysis of this group of contaminants requires further improvement in terms of sensitivity and selectivity, especially for very complex matrices such as wastewater. Why is wastewater very complex matrix? Because the wastewater from any industry, let us take the example of a textile industry, will have all the you know chemicals that have been used in process 1, 2, 3, 4 and as many processes the textile has gone through. So, it is a collective uh, you know contaminants, a list of contaminants will be present and therefore, the mattress becomes very very complicated or complex. And to be able to pull out the nanogram present contaminant will be a big challenge and there and there are no regulatory bodies to uh, say that the, these are the list of contaminants that need to be analyzed from every industry it will vary. So, textile industry will have a different kind of a wastewater uh, uh, chemical composition, the leather industry will have a different kind of a chemical composition in their wastewater and so on and so forth. So, you look at any industry and if they are generating wastewater, the chemical profile will be entirely different. And to be able to you know selectively uh, you know analyze one by one all these contaminants, it is a big challenge for the analyst. Acidic pharmaceuticals, some of the examples that we have taken here are for very specific compounds. If the contaminants are rich in acidic pharmaceuticals, 
what are the methods that can be usually applied for the analysis. Different methods mainly based on liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and GCMS that is gas chromatography mass spectrometry in combination with either polymer or C18 based solid phase extraction SPE are being developed for the analysis of pharmaceutical compounds. However, most methods are tailored for neutral compounds that is antibiotics and less complex matrices such as surface and groundwater. While only a limited number of papers or research has be, uh, describes procedures applicable to the analysis of polar drugs in wastewater. A survey of analytical methods for the quantification of regularly used polar pharmaceuticals in wastewater matrices have, uh, has also been observed. So, you see that the methods have been developed for non-polar compounds such as antibiotics particularly from less complex matrices like surface and groundwater, but then wastewaters are very, very complex matrices. From there how to analyze the polar uh, drugs is a big challenge for the analyst. However, there are methods which you makes use of LCMS that is liquid chromatography with mass spectrometry or GCMS gas chromatography with mass spectrometry in combination with the C18 solid phase extraction because the most important part is the extraction. The, the more beautifully the extraction or the more effectively the extraction can be done, the analysis will be facilitated accordingly. Most of the uh, popular techniques that are used for analyzing the contaminants in water, wastewater, surface water, ground water are the following. As a result, use of LCMS and sometimes LCMS LC and MS. You see, this is further um, you know hyphenated. It has two MS is increasing. When, re when reviewing the principal methods for the analysis of pharmaceuticals in aqueous environmental samples, LCMS MS is the technique of choice for assaying polar pharmaceuticals and their metabolites. However, there is a difficulty in enrichment step as well as the low resolution and signal suppression of the electrospray ESI interface because of the matrix impurities. So, one LCMS is not sufficient for the analysis of pharmaceuticals. It is made to understand that LCMS MS that means two MSs are required. Why? Because the electrospray interface of the matrix impurities requires another MS to do actual fragmentation. Comparison of LC, ESI MS and GC MS after derivatization with BF3 methanol for monitoring some acidic and very polar analgesic like salicylic acid, ketoprofen, naproxen and all uh, uh, ibuprofen. These medicines when they are present in surface water or waste water, how they are uh, analyzed with the help of this LC, ESI, MS and the comparison is made with GCMS. Results show a good correlation between methods except for gemfriberzil for which derivatization was not completely achieved in some samples. So, here it is important that these drugs have to be derivatized first and then analyzed otherwise they cannot be analyzed like salicylic acid which is nothing but uh, you know the simple aspirin that we use or ketoprofen, naproxen, uh, diclofenac and ibuprofen. These are very, very typical analgesic drugs which need to be derivatized before analysis. In general, the limits of detection that is the LOD achieved with LCMS MS methods were slightly higher than those obtained with GCMS. Obviously, 
when there is a furthermore MS hyphenated to LCMS, it has to have a greater sensitivity whereas, GCMS has only one MS. So, the sensitivity also uh, is lower and which is rightly reflected when the two methods are compared. LCMS methodology showed advantages in terms of versatility and sample preparation being less complicated that is derivatization was not required. Another advantage is that if one is using LCMS MS then derivatization may or may not be required, but when one is using GCMS derivatization is a must because it has to be converted into a volatile derivative to be able to pass through the GC column. Similarly, there are very specific methods for the analysis of uh, this water con uh, contaminant called acidic pesticide. Chlorinated phenoxy acid herbicides account for the major majority of pesticide used worldwide and their presence in environmental water is well documented. However, their behavior during wastewater treatment has rarely been studied. This group includes for example, the mycoprop that is MCPP, MCPA, 24D, 24DP, 2453T and 24DB. These compounds are characterized by high polarity and thermal liability. For these reasons, the liquid chromatography is generally more suited for their analysis. However, the method used to determine chlorinated phenoxy acid herbicides are still dominated by GC. So, one can make use of GC, but LC that is liquid chromatography are also popularly used for these kind of herbicides such as MCPP, MCPA, 24D, 24T, uh, 245T, 24DB, 24DP. However, methods used to determine chlorinated phenoxy acid herbicide are still dominated by GC with either electron capture detection or that is the one can use GC with ECD detector or GC MS. The main disadvantage of GC analysis is that it requires prior der derivatization step usually using highly toxic and carcinogenic diazomethane or less frequently used acid anhydride, benzyl halides and alkyl chloroformates. The injection port derivatization with an iron pair reagent has been successfully applied as well as in situ de derivatization prior to solid phase micro extraction is possible. So, if we are using LCMS then there is no need for any kind of derivatization for acidic pesticides or herbicide. But if we are making use of GC with ECD detector or GCMS, it is necessary to derivatize and sometimes this derivatization requires very hazardous chemical like diazomethane and also sometimes use of acetic anhydride acid anhydride, benzyl halide and alkyl chloroformate. Now, this kind of injector port uh, derivatization at the injector port with the help of this iron pair uh, reagent can be successfully carried out and it has been done with the help of this solid phase micro extraction in situ on that also it can be derivatized. Antiseptic compounds, several methods have been proposed for the determination of tri triclosan that is 5 chloro 224 dichlorophenoxyphenol, which is used as an antiseptic agent in vast array of personal care such as toothpaste, acne cream, deodorant, shampoo, toilet soap and consumer products such as children's toy, footwear, kitchen cutting boards, etc. Now, to be able to analyze these and, and this particular antiseptic 5 chloro 224 dichlorophenoxyphenol, 
which is so popularly used in so many uh, substances of daily use, it is a big challenging method. The method based on diazomethane derivatization and analysis on GC with ECD detector was applied for the quantification of triclosan in the wastewater of slaughterhouse as well as other places. So, you see that diazomethane derivatization is a prerequisite in order to be able to analyze these antiseptics. Alkyl phenolic compounds, the trace analysis of alkyl phenolic ethanolates and their acidic metabolites by LCMS and LCMS MS using atmospheric pressure chemical ionization method or ESI method was recently reviewed and the analytical performance for oligomeric mixtures of PEO that is the alkyl phenolic compounds uh, that phenol ethoxylates could be carried out very effectively. Generally, an ESI interface is used for the analysis of alkyl phenolic compounds because of its higher sensitivity, especially for alkyl phenol and carboxylated compounds. So, you see that these compounds are very, very typical surfactants and they need to be analyzed because uh, and the method should be very soft electrospray uh, method for the ionization in the MS. Otherwise, it is not possible to analyze this alkyl phenol so easily. And because the ESI interface is well suited because of its high sensitivity, it is uh, matching with the requirement of these compounds alkyl phenolic compounds. The alkyl phenoxy carboxylates were detected in both uh, NI and PI modes. In the NI mode, the using e ESI gives two types of ion, one corresponding to the deprotonated M minus H that is M by Z you will find at 277, 321, 263 and 307 corresponding to nonyl phenol carboxylate nonyl phenol carbox, uh, ethoxy carboxylate, octyl phenol carboxylate and octyl phenol ethoxy carboxylate uh, respectively. So, these are various types of surfactants that need to be typically analyzed by the LCMS MS machine and cannot be uh, escaped because they uh, make serious contamination in water. Elimination by modern uh, wastewater treatment plants, although adopted as the best available technology, biological treatment affects only partial removal of wide range of emerging contaminants, especially polar ones, which are discharged into the final effluent. Thus, it, were, it has become evident that the application of more enhanced technologies may be crucial to fulfill the requirements to recycle municipal and industrial wastewater as drinking water. In recent years, there have been studies of new technologies for not only wastewater treatment, but also production of drinking water. Among them, the membrane treatment using both biological membranes and non-biological processes, reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration and so on have been applied. And the Oxidation processes are most frequently considered as they may be appropriate for removing trace concentrations of emerging polar contaminants. So, now what has been done that in big countries, in more advanced countries, in the developed countries, what they are trying to do? They are uh, trying to eliminate various processes at the wastewater treatment plant itself. And therefore, by the use of modern technology that is for treatment, they are using membrane for, for both um, biological as well as non-biological processes. Membranes are used and therefore, a lot of contaminants are removed by these uh, membranes. And of course, the oxidative processes 
the biological processes of treatment of uh, wastewater are other means. Membrane technology or membrane processes, MBR technology is considered the most promising development in microbiological wastewater treatment. Now, when economic reasons no longer limit the application of MBRs in industrial and municipal wastewater treatment plants and new requirements are being set to wastewater treatment, MBRs may be key in direct or indirect recycling of wastewater. So, it is of course, analysis is important, but what is being done at the root level only the membrane technology or other kind of processes are being applied on the wastewater treatment plants. So, that the contaminant level in the waste treated wastewater becomes very, very low. The low sludge load in terms of BOD, so that the bacteria are forced to mineralize poorly degrade organic compounds and the long life of the sludge gives the bacteria time to adapt to the treatment resistance substances. So, there are advantages, very, uh, very important advantages that the membrane technology is actually very useful because these bacteria can uh, face very little low sludge and therefore, they can thrive on it and they can mineralize on it and because they can have a long life on the sludge therefore, the treatment is most effective. Treatment by AOPs, there have been studies of AOPs which use a combination of ozone and other oxidative reagents. UV radiation, hydrogen peroxide, titanium dioxide to enhance the degradation of polar pharmaceuticals and NEO uh, metabolites. It is found to be that they you know these need to be treated with very good oxidizing agent. Pilot plant for ozonation and UV dis disinfection of effluents from a German municipal wastewater treatment plant containing antibiotics, beta blockers, antiphlogistics, lipid regulator metabolites, musk fragrances and iodinated x-ray contrast media. So, when 10 to 15 milligram ozone was used, contact time was required was 18 minute, no pharmaceutical were detected. However, the ionic iodinated x-ray contrast compounds exhibited removal efficiency no higher than 14 percent. So, when a combination of such uh, matters is present, it is possible that only few can get oxygenated and the others may not even get even affected. In ozonation, it was demonstrated that it is suitable tool for carbamazine pine abatement even under the process conditions usually adopted in drinking water facilities. However, despite good primary elimination, a low degree of mineralization was observed and there was no proper total carbon balance even after prolonged ozonation, which indicated the presence of unidentified degradation products. So, sometimes what happens is that even when ozone is passed through for a longer period of time, it is not effective because of some unidentified degraded product which uh, hampers the effectivity of ozone. And therefore, no one method is foolproof, but these are all corrective measures so that some of the compounds can be broken down, can be oxidized, can be mineralized and removed from the wastewater and the effective wastewater treatment can be brought about. Elimination in drinking water treatment plants. Now, this is of utmost importance to human being because it is to be understood that drinking water is of prime importance to all, one and all. The occurrence of organic micro contaminants in raw water and their removal in the course of production of drinking water and possible formation of disinfection byproducts are key issues in relation to the quality of drinking water. However, several studies have shown 
that the removal of emerging polar contaminants during drinking water treatment is incomplete. Elimination of selected pharmaceuticals that is the chlorofibric acid and some of these medicines during drinking water treatment was investigated. Sand filtration under aerobic and anoxic conditions as well as flocculation with iron 3 chloride did not significantly eliminate the target pharmaceuticals, while ozonation was quite effective in eliminating these polar compounds. The diclofenac and the carbamazine was reduced by more than 90 percent, the beza fibrate was eliminated by 50 percent, while the chlorofibric uh, acid was stable even at high ozone dose. Filtration with granular activated carbon that is the GAC under waterworks condition was very effective in removing pharmaceuticals apart from the chlorofibric acid less of which was absorbed. So, you see a combination of method is most often required when we are talking about drinking water. No one method you will see, I told you so many examples, the acidic pharmaceuticals, the surfactants and then the uh, antiseptics, the medicines, they all are present in the mattress. And to be able to remove that with just one method, it is impossible. So, a combination of sand filtration, ozonation, use of granular activated charcoal, these are some of the standard methods. Elimination of neutral and acidic uh, nonyl phenols also can be brought about with very effectively by using LCMS MS method. We have already described the method LCMS MS. So, first it is allowed to set and flocculation is done by rapid sand filtration which takes care of 7 percent purification. Then ozonation takes place and 87 percent purification is possible. Then with the use of granular activated charcoal another 73 uh, percent you know uh, of such metabolites can be removed. And final disinfection with chlorine resulting in overall elimination in the range of 96 to 99 percent uh, can be achieved for the drinking water. So, you see it is not such an easy process to remove these neutral and acidic nonyl phenol ethoxylates because they are very, very complicated structures and they need to be uh, separated through various steps by using various reagents by sand filtration, ozonation, granulate, uh, granulated activated charcoal, only then the it becomes purified to be able to be like uh, uh, fit for drinking water. So, con to conclude this, I would say that application of advanced LCMS and GCMS technologies for environmental analysis is allowed to determine a broad range of compound, thus permitted more comprehensive assessment of the environmental contaminants, particularly in water. Among the various compounds considered as emerging pollutants, acidic pharmaceutical, surfactant degrades and the acidic pesticides are of particular concern, because of both their ubiquity in the aquatic environment and health concern. Because they are so harmful to our uh, health, that is why it is important to eliminate them. And thus entire reuse and reviewing of the uh, wastewater treatment plant effluent must be taken into consideration. A disinfection process must be included that is chlorination and ozonation. And therefore, one can expect that the levels of contaminant would be reduced. So, with this we come to the last part of our lecture, which is then related to analytical method validity and quality assurance. Having learned all this while, the various processes that can be carried out, the analytical method, one must understand the importance of its validity and quality assurance and its correlation with uh, quality assurance. 
validation method. We have said that it is important to see whether the machine is validated or not. The use of validated methods is important for an analytical laboratory to show its qualification and competency. In this update, an analytical quality, we place validation of analytical methodologies in the broader context of quality assurance. So, quality assurance can only be correlated if there is the method is validated. Different approaches to validation giving attention to different characteristics of method performance, the concept of single laboratory or in-house validation, inter-laboratory or co co collaborative study, standardization, internal quality control, proficiency testing, accreditation and finally, analytical quality con assurance is what actually matters for a laboratory. Because if we say that we have generated an analysis, that does not mean it is an absolute value. Can it be repeated? And if the machines are working properly, if the method is validated, only then there will be a repeatability. So, all other things that is a single laboratory concept and the inter laboratory or collaborative study standardization is a must. Otherwise, my result and result from another laboratory will differ. And if the analysis is differing, that means it is not being done or the method is not validated. This lecture provides a good complete up to date collation of relevant, relevant information in the field of analytical method validation and quality assurance. It describes the different aspects of method validation. So, if we try to look at the role of method validation, it is the term validation and quality assurance are widely used. However, a lot of analysts and laboratories do not know the exact meaning either, the difference nor the relationship between the two terms. The validating method or when we say we are validating a method, it is investigating whether the analytical purpose of the method is achieved, which is obtaining analytical results and with the acceptability of uncertainty level. That means, it should not have too much of an error. Analytical method validation forms the first level of quality assurance. So, therefore, they, are, they go hand in hand. If the method is validated, if the machine is work, working properly, the it is assured that there is a quality assurance from the results that are derived from those machines. If you try to look at this particular slide, which is the last slide of the lecture, I would like you to appreciate that any analytical system which generates analytical results give measurements and that could fall in the range of uncertainty or certainty. The accuracy will only be established if we have an inter, inter laboratory quality control and the method is validated fit for the purpose and therefore, proficiency test and accreditation are important factors in this line of uh, quality assurance. So, if we try to now take an overview of the entire course that we have just gone through the advanced level of uh, analytical chemistry course you will see that I tried to take you through the journey of various chromatographic and spectroscopic methods, including the fact that we must also understand that every analysis needs validation and that requires, that gives us the quality assurance for finding out whether the analysis has been done properly. So, with this we have come to an end of this course. Thank you.